Hi class, today we're going to be talking about um, oxygenation and tissue perfusion. Um, we're going to talk about some terms that you need to be aware of. The first term is ventilation, and ventilation is defined as the actual act of breathing, both with inspiration and expiration. When we talk about respiration, we're talking about the actual gas exchange that takes place with deep within the lungs in which oxygenation um, and release of carbon dioxide takes place. And so that's what we mean by respiration. The lungs also have what's called compliance. And if you remember, that is um, the ease or the ability for the lungs to inflate. and issues with compliance or decreased compliance can um, decrease the amount of respiration and make ventilation more difficult. So changes can occur with scar tissue, edema, and decreased surfactant which keeps the uh, lung tissues from sticking together. Um, we also talk about the elastic recoil of the fibers actually um, within the lung itself and that is that that gives those fibers the ability to return to their original position. So changes can occur in any disease process or anything that causes an overstretching of those elastin fibers and emphysema is a great example of that and then we have airway resistance and that's related to the amount of resistance there is to the airflow. Asthma or um, an asthmatic occurrence um, increases the airway resistance, which means it makes it harder for the lungs to um, get air and because your airways are more narrow. So let's look at the structure and the function of oxygenation. We know that we need adequate oxygenation of our tissues, but there are a couple of systems that um, this process is very dependent on. The first would be our cardiovascular system, and the second would be our respiratory system. That's why we call this often the cardiopulmonary, where those two have to work in conjunction with each other. A change in one can impact the ability or the effectiveness of the other because they work together to be able to oxygenate the tissues. Breathing in oxygen and delivering it to the blood system requires both a healthy respiratory system and a, an intact cardiovascular system, which then will circulate that oxygenated blood. So this is just kind of a schematic uh, review of how um, blood is brought back into the heart, oxygenated, where it exchanges in the capillaries of the lungs, and then is returned back to the heart and then sent out to the body for distribution. So we know that within our respiratory system, there are two components that it's divided into. We have an upper respiratory tract and we have a lower respiratory tract. And this is important when we look at certain disease processes, whether they're diseases of the lower respiratory tract or the upper respiratory tract. So we know that when air comes in, we call that inspiration. That's the breathing of air the lungs inflate, the chest expands, um, oxygenated air is uh, drawn down into the lungs. And we know that in the alveolar sacs, there is blood flow to there, and it is there in which the oxygenation and exchange for carbon dioxide, which is then exhaled out. And we know that we don't just breathe out carbon dioxide, that we breathe out there is, a, there is oxygen in that as well. So some factors that can influence both our car the cardiopulmonary system would be where we, in our lifespan or development, we know that when a baby is born premature, that the lungs are not fully developed and that can create issues um, within the cardiopulmonary system, both the act of breathing and the ability of the lung tissue itself to um, expand and um, exhale. We know that within our environment there are factors such as pollutants, such as um, 
those types of things that can impact that system. Lifestyle, that would be um, our diet, our amount of exercise, whether we smoke or we don't smoke. And smoking actually includes anything in which you inhale a fume into your um, lungs. It used to be we just looked at cigarette smoking, but now we need to look at things like do people hookah, do people use vapor, do people use marijuana, especially with more and more states legalizing it. And there are also medications that can impact this. There are pathological conditions, and any pathological condition that causes alterations in O2 or CO2 levels, conditions that um, change our neuromuscular system, MS, Huntington's disease, um, cervical spine trauma, can change our ability to be able to regulate our respirations and uh, or control the muscles needed or the signals from our brain which trigger us to breathe. There are changes within diseases that cause changes in oxygen transport, such as anemia. Um, we know that with anemia we have less uh, red blood cells and without re enough red blood cells our body cannot adequately transport enough oxygen. You can have metabolic changes. If you look at someone with di diabetic ketoacidosis, um, there is um, some hypoxia that goes along with that. So we also have alterations in our cardiovascular system. So we know that if our heart isn't functioning um, correctly, that we will have a decreased amount of oxygen that reads the tissue level. And if these tissues don't have adequate oxygenation, then the tissues run the risk of not being able to function correctly. So the heart requires blood flow to the myocardium itself. So we know we have coronary artery circulation or coronary circulation. And when we have a disruption in the blood flow to our myocardium, this is what we call a myocardial ischemia, myocardial injury, myocardial death. And we often term this in a big picture of a myocardial infarction. And this often happens and more likely because there is a narrowing of the arteries. This can be from atherosclerosis, could be from spasms, could be from a clot, could be from a congenital malformation within the arteries itself. Also, we have uh, changes in oxygenation when we have cardiac rhythm irregularities. And if we have a patient who has um, heart failure, whether it be right-sided or left-sided or both, we can have alterations in our respiratory, which relates to oxygenation. We know people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease are unable to um, adequately oxygenate the blood which circulates in their body. And we know that emphysema is a disease that damages and inflames the alveolar walls. Patients with chronic bronchitis have uh, large airways, but they also increase their production of mucus. And this mucus um, can impede the ability of gases to diffuse across the membrane. Pneumonia can cause alterations in respiratory and the ability of the oxygen to exchange. And we also have atelectasis, which is a small collapse of lung tissue in which if there's a collapse because of um, infiltrates uh, and uh, mucus plugs, then um, there's no gas exchange that takes place in the area, aerial distal to this collapse. This is just a picture for just to kind of jog your memory of what it looks like to have asthma, emphysema, or bronchitis and how that impacts um, the ability to get oxygen in, the ability to diffuse the gas across the membrane. So what do we look for when we're nurses? Assessment is key for us often. So we're gonna start with a health history. We wanna do some focus questioning. We wanna know why the patient is here or what is their current complaint. It may be that they're feeling short of breath or that they can't catch their breath. It may be an acute or it may be a chronic issue. We're gonna gather subjective data. This is the data that the patient tells us verbally. So we're gonna look at his health history. We're gonna look at their past medical history. We might look at medications that they're telling us that they're getting. So then we're gonna gather our objective data. 
And that's the get information we gather during our assessment. So we're going to do a focused cardiopulmonary assessment. And we're going to do this on patients who have um, decreased oxygenation. They look short of breath. They're working extra hard to breathe. They have visible cyanosis. They're complaining of a difficulty getting their air. They're unable to do activity without either feeling very fatigued or very short of breath. And maybe they have a history of cardiopulmonary um, disease. So we're going to look at vital signs. That includes blood pressure, respiratory rate, and apical and peripheral pulses. We're going to watch the chest. We're going to see if there's any abnormalities that we visualize, but we're also going to look at the muscles that are used to breathe. Are they using them more forcefully? Are they using all of them? Do you see both sides of the chest rise and fall? Do you see them struggle to get an air in? Do you notice whether inspiration or expiration are um, longer than they should be? We may palpate over the pericardium. We're going to assess if we can for any um, abnormal vibrations. We're going to listen to both heart sounds and lung sounds. We're going to listen and note a cough if they have one, and that needs to be evaluated, the type of cough it is. Um, is it um, produced sputum? Does it not produce sputum? Is it dry? Is it hacky? We also want to look at the vascular system. Do they have edema in their extremities? We're going to look at the peripheral vascular system. We're going to look at pedal pulses. We're going to look at their skin color. We're going to look at the texture of the skin. Is it dry? Is it moist? Are they diaphoretic? And we want to know what their capillary refill is. We might do some laboratory and diagnostic testing. Now, every patient may not get all of these, but these are options that are available um, to help um, with your assessment. You might look at a patient's forced vital capacity. Um, we might look at the forced expiratory volume. We might look at the forced expiratory flow. We might look to see if they have a residual volume. This might be important in a patient who has um, emphysema. We want to know how much air trapping are they having. Um, how much volume do they really um, expire when they breathe out? Um, how forceful can they get their air out? And we do want to look at residual volumes because then we want to assess for air trapping in patients with chronic with COPD. We might run some laboratory tests. We might do a CBC. Um, things that a CBC can tell us is um, the amount of red blood cells, hemoglobin, hematocrit, uh, we might look at their WBCs to see if they um, have an infection going on. We might look at some things that might uh, tell us their ability to actually carry the transporters. We might look at a metabolic panel where we're looking for renal function. What is their glucose? Because we know that we're going to have um, some problems if our patient is diabetically and diabetic ketoacidosis, or perhaps they're, super, they're severely hypoglycemic. And we want to look at any type of electrolyte imbalance. We might look at arterial blood gases. Arterial blood gases assess both the oxygenation status and the acid-base balance. So when I look at an arterial blood gas, I look for my acid-base balance. So I will look at pH, CO2, and bicarb and I want to know where my patient stands. But I also need to look at the PO2 and the calculated O2 saturation because I need to know if my patient is hypoxic. So remember when you're looking at arterial blood gases to look at both the acid-base balance, if there's one, and also the oxygenation status of your patient. Sometimes they may look at lipid panels. What this might help us with is if patients with hyperlipidemia, we know that they're at higher risk for coronary artery disease. And we know that coronary artery disease narrows the vascular system of the coronary arteries. And it can actually do changes in any artery that we have. And so therefore, um, we might see pulmonary hypertension in patients 
rare, but it can occur. But we know with narrowing, um, it tires the heart muscle and a weakened heart muscle is not able to pump the oxygenated blood to the body as well. You might see people do cardiac enzymes um, and these um, are done on patients with chest pain or signs and symptoms that they might be having a myocardial infarction. It helps us determine if there was damage to the heart muscle itself. Some other tests, you might see a patient receive a chest x-ray. And in a chest x-ray, it allows us to look at the lung tissue. It allows us to look at the bone structure, such as ribs, to determine are there fractures. We can also look at the trachea to see if we have a tracheal deviation or any tracheal um, blockage, such as perhaps a tumor. But we can also get a silhouette of the cardiac heart and so often, sometimes we can see if a patient might have an enlarged heart on x-ray. We might do an electrocardiogram. So we're gonna look at the electrical activity of the heart. The picture you see here is um, a normal um, one singular beat or one normal electrical cardiac cycle of the heart and um, we look for abnormalities in that. Changes in the QRS, changes in the ST segment, changes in the P wave, the PR interval. And these, if there are changes, can have some impact on um, uh, blood circulating uh, to the body as well as um, things going on within the heart muscle itself. Some patients may receive a echocardiogram, which is a, like a heart ultrasound. So what they're looking for there is, are there any heart defects, perhaps from birth? We might be able to see a pericardial effusion, which is fluid around the heart itself. So if there's fluid in that sac, it is harder for the heart to contract because that fluid is constricting um, the muscle itself. We can look for disorders of heart valves, which if our heart valves have changes or abnormalities, um, it may make it harder for that valve to open. The valve may be narrow, which means it's going to take a greater force and create more workload on the heart. Or the valve may just not be able, those leaflets close adequately, and so then you get backflow into the backward um, vent, to the backward inlet, and so then not all of the cardiac output will be sent to the next um, component in the, uh, in the circulation. So we need to know that there is some collaboration. We need to know that um, when we care for patients with oxygenation problems, there is a coordination of care, both with nursing, medicine, often respiratory therapy. Speech therapy will help us if patients have swallowing problems, then we need to make adjustments in fluids because they're at higher risk for aspiration. And if they're at higher risk for aspiration, those thinner fluids or oral things may find their way actually into the lung space itself. And we might coordinate with physical therapy because physical therapy can help us get our patients up and walking which we know is good for lung expansion. So you can see the different roles here within the collaboration of patients um, with oxygenation issues. So kind of our goal, um, especially if we're going to use oxygen therapy, is we want to decrease the symptoms um, that the patient is having related to their low oxygen levels and their decreased cardiovascular system workload. So we want to um, do a good assessment and we want to look at our laboratory data if we have it. So hypoxemia may be seen in your patient as a um, elevated respiratory rate and or an elevated heart rate. You might also see decreased oxygen saturation or pulse oximetry. You might see changes in skin color, such as cyanosis. The patient may be complaining of shortness of breath, difficulty getting their breath, and they may also have, and I'm sorry I didn't put it on here, some changes in um, their neurostatus or level of consciousness. They just may seem more confused. They might be more agitated. 
they um, might be difficult to reorient and redirect because they're so anxious about not being able to catch their breath and lack of oxygen that they are on a fight or flight mode. So we might have some precautions and important things that we have to monitor if we're going to administer oxygen. So we know with patients with chronic hypercapnia, or we know that that's elevated CO2, are at risk for respiratory depression when we use oxygen levels that are too high for them. And that is because we um, take away what it is that initiates their need to breathe. So these patients breathe um, because we know that normal changes relate to hypercapnia but their body gets used to the high levels of CO2 from their disease. And so often their drive is related to hypoxia. So their brain has now changed to where when their O2 levels decrease, that initiates their need to breathe. Where if we override that with too high of oxygen supplementation, then the patient may actually forget to breathe. There is no neurostimulus for them to breathe. We need to be aware that um, oxygen does have risk and sometimes we want to be careful that percentage of oxygen that we use. So the thing is we use the least amount that we need to to reach the goal that we intend to arrive at. We know that oxygen is a fire hazard and um, we know that if patients use nebulizers and we add humidification that that can um, develop bacterial contamination which can put the patient at higher risk for development of an infection. So there are devices that deliver oxygen and they are either in low flow system, reservoir systems, high flow. The most common low flow system is the nasal cannula and mask delivery systems gather and store oxygen between patient breaths. Um, we can have partial non-rebreathers or non-rebreathers, and those contain a reservoir bag that is flexible and has an oxygen inlet. These um, partial rebreather and non-rebreather masks um, allow for a higher level of inspired oxygen. So we know that we have to do documentation. We must document the assessment that we obtained before we put the patient on the oxygen device, which means we need to get a baseline assessment that would include um, an assessment of the respiratory system, assessment of cardiovascular system, an assessment of the neuro system, and anything the patient was verbalizing to us during this time. We want to know what the patient's vital signs are, and that includes oxygen saturation as well. And then we um, initiate our oxygen therapy, and then about 15 to 30 minutes, we reassess those. We need to know if the change that we made impacted the patients um, or it did what we wanted it to do. So if I put oxygen on a patient, my intention is I'm going to decrease their respiratory distress and I'm gonna improve their oxygen level. And so I should see hopefully a decrease in agitation an improvement in respiratory rate, which means it will be less. They will do less work of breathing. I might see less anxiety. But the big key is, is that I, am I seeing an improvement in my O2 saturation? And if I am, then and I'm at the goal, say 95%, then I know I have the patient is on the level of oxygen that they need to be on. Um, but if they're not, I'm either, going to, I'm either going to have to increase or change the mode at which I deliver that oxygen at. You might also see CPAP or BiPAP applications. Um, and these are uh, additional mechanical things that actually help force the air into the lungs. And I'll show you and have a little more discussion about CPAP and BiPAP when we meet on Monday to talk about oxygenation. It's a little bit easier to do if you can actually see what I'm talking about um, and how it works. There is also the emergency use of oxygen. This would be the bag valve mask device. 
you all were evaluated on this when you did your CPR course. And so these are for people who need um, respiratory support, either because they have no respirations going on or because the respirations they have are ineffective. So how do we manage airways? Well, we can um, manage them with what's called a pharyngeal airway. And these are used when the patient is just getting some obstruction from the tongue itself. And so we can either use a nasopharyngeal airway, which is placed in the nose, or we can use an oral pharyngeal airway, which is placed in the mouth. And uh, we'll demonstrate uh, what these look like and how you insert them on Monday in lab. And these are the extra key points of documentation that you would need to have if you were using either type of airway. You'll often see patients on what we call a nasal cannula. Um, the pictures show you what it looks like. Um, nasal cannula is low flow. The oxygen itself is sent into the nares or the nose. We want to be sure that we look at the skin both behind the ears and under and in the nares for redness or breakdown before we apply these because we are going to have this plastic tubing laying against those skin structures. And the prongs um, rest at the base of the nares and are slightly inserted into the nose. Um, we use uh, one to six liters of oxygen and if we're going to go four or greater than four we need to consider adding some humidification because the nasal cannula or nasal oxygen um, is drying to those membranes of the nares. This little chart below that tells you one liter equals 24 percent it's a good idea to uh, understand and perhaps be familiar with this um, chart to know when you take a patient from two liters when you put them on one liter we know that the environment in which we breathe oxygen is 21 percent so when we add one liter we take them to 24 percent so this might help you determine how much oxygen your patient is getting and then what kind of changes you'll see if you um, at the various uh, liters of oxygenation that are present. We can put a patient on what's called a simple mask. This is also a low flow oxygen system and we set our oxygen either to 5 to 10 liters. Uh, the simple mask has no reservoir bag um, and it's used for patients who need a little bit higher oxygen delivery or we want to include both the mouth and the nose as a way in which um, the patient will breathe in the supplemental oxygen. So be sure you assess the facial skin and behind the ears. Just note that masks sometimes can make your patient feel claustrophobic and they don't really want to wear it. And you need to be sure it fits secure under the chin and you get a nice firm fit um, around the nose and along the face and under the chin. And we'll be uh, looking at these and playing with these on Monday. Um, after lecture, Monday after lecture. You can have a partial non-rebreather. This also is a low flow oxygen system. We use oxygen flow rates between 6 and 15 liters. This allows some exhaled air to enter the reservoir, so there is a mixing um, of carbon dioxide with the oxygen. And for some patients, this is, um, can act as a stimulus to breathe. And we do the same assessment as we would for the simple mask. So then we have the non-rebreather mask. This is also a low flow system. The oxygen flow rates um, are 10 to 15. The oxygen percentages should read 60 to 100. That zero, um, I must have typed two. So please note it's 60 to 100. Once again, six zero to 100. There are valves um, on this mask. And in the picture, you can see the orange disc and that is the valve. And what this is, is that it prevents 
the exhaled air from actually leaving the mask. But it also, pre okay, and then the reservoir, which is the bag, has a one-way valve. So when the patient breathes their exhaled air, it doesn't, um, uh, they don't breathe it, um, they aren't allowed, the exhale there isn't going to go into the bag. So they aren't going to breathe any mixed uh, CO2. They're going to be breathing in 100% oxygen or the percentage that you set it at that's in that bag. So they're not going to have any mixing of environmental air. It's very important that we make sure that the reservoir, um, some manufacturers you won't actually see an inflation of the bag, some you will, but we want to make sure that we have a good fit and the same assessment as any other mask. What you might ask yourself right now, and I'm sure you're all wondering, is how do I know which um, oxygen mask to use? Some of that comes to, uh, is related to the physician order. The physician may say nasal cannula. The physician may say non-rebreather. And so then that decision is made for you um, because of the physician order. Uh, sometimes it's going to be uh, a nursing judgment, which means you're going to have an order that reads such as titrate FiO2 to keep oxygen saturation greater than 94%. And so then what you have to decide is how am I going to get that? We often, for the most part, use the nasal cannula unless the order asks us to put on a mask. And however, okay, and then let's say I have a patient who is uh, suddenly very hypoxic. Uh, I come in, the O2 saturation is 78, they're having trouble breathing, their skin color is dusky. I would suggest that you go at the best oxygenation choice and that would be a non-rebreather mask at 15 liters because the patient will be receiving in this emergent situation through the oxygen mask 100% oxygen and then after the patient gets stabilized and we understand what the contributing factors were we will work at taking the patient or titrating down the patient to uh, not only an oxygen percentage, but a mode of oxygenation that is both the most comfortable for the patient and achieves the goal of oxygenation that we're looking for. Some patients may be on what's called a Venturi mask. This is a high flow oxygen system because we have really specific control over the amount of oxygen or percentage of that the patient is getting. The Venturi mask is similar to another mask. It does have the exhalation ports. Um, it has a flexible tubing. But we have this dial here so that we uh, put our flow rate up, but our oxygen percentage is not related to our flow rate. It's either related to the colored adapter attached in the picture that you see, or some may have a dial. So you can set it for 40% and 32% and et cetera. This is often helpful in patients with uh, who retain CO2 because we can get a more specific percentage of oxygen and we have a tighter control to help prevent um, the depression of their hypoxic drive. Patients can have tracheal airways. So these are airways that actually go into the trachea. So there are a couple choices. You can either have a tracheostomy, which is done with a hole in the neck area and the thing is inserted into the trachea or patients may have what's called an endotracheal tube which are either inserted orally or nasally and also go into the trachea and sit just before the bifurcation of where you break off to the right and left bronchia. So now we're going to talk about suctioning because that's part of our maintenance of patients and we do this with patients who 
who need our assistance to clear their airway. Um, secretions are removed via a catheter or some type of removal device that is connected to a suction source. And the suction source is set to um, low to medium suction between the low and medium. We never want to set it on high suction because that's just too much suction force. Um, it is sterile for when we are entering the tracheal airways. And if we're using, um, if we're going down the nasopharyngeal airway and um, down towards the back of the throat. However, when we use a yonker for oral suctioning, that is aseptic. And um, we always want to assess um, the patient if who is in respiratory distress first and then we're going to suction them. But even if they're not in respiratory distress, we do a good respiratory assessment, we do a good secretion assessment so that we have our baseline in which to reassess the patient upon the completion of our suctioning. Routes of suctioning can include oral or nasopharyngeal and these are for patients who cannot effectively cough out their secretions. We can do oral tracheal or nasal tracheal. And these are patients who can't even really cough, um, but the secretions are in the oral or nasal tracheal area. And then we can do tracheostomy or endotracheal suctioning, which is the type of suctioning when a patient has an artificial airway. And as far as suctioning goes, we will be doing some hands-on uh, practice, setup, and understanding of the actual process when we meet at, on the Monday after this lecture um, to talk more about this. So how do we maintain and promote lung expansion? So patients can receive chest physiotherapy, and these include things such as postural drainage, coughing and deep breathing, and the use of incentive spirometer. So we know that we turn patients because it helps um, improve lung expansion, it helps move secretions, it helps decrease pulmonary stasis, we know it helps maintain ventilation and oxygenation, and it does increase lung expansion. And so um, we also have them deep breathe and then cough so that we can get um, as much lung expansion as we can, which is beyond our normal um, average when we're just breathing when we sleep. We get a better and fuller lung expansion when you actually ask the patient to deep breathe. The purpose of asking them to cough is because it allows them to move anything that is uh, loosened or present from the deep breathing and the turning. You may uh, do your deep breathing using an incentive spirometer, which is an actual device that um, the patient takes a deep breath into, and it has a, some may have a ball, some may have a gauge, and then the goal is for them to breathe as deep as they can and to hold that ball or that gauge in place at the level they have taken the deep breath to, for the, about the count of three and then to exhale it out. And that um, increases the full lung expansion and the holding of the breath keeps the lung open at that level. And sometimes it helps patients to visually see how deep their breaths actually are. Um, and you can use postural drainage, which is sometimes patients are placed in positions to assist movement. You might see patients put in trend, slight Trendelenburg, which gravity might move those secretions up the respiratory tract. You might see them turned up high on their side um, to increase full expansion of the non-dependent lung and to hopefully move a little bit of those secretions with the changes in position. Always remember with postural drainage, you wanna make sure that the benefit um, outweighs the risk because there can be complications. There can be hypoxemia. Patients with head injuries could develop an increase in their intracranial pressure.
you might see a drop in blood pressure with the change of position. You, they might develop a bronchospasm or vomit um, that would be unf that can be an aspiration an issue if a patient vomits in Trendelenburg. You might increase their pain, and it could cause um, a cardiac uh, dysrhythmia. Medications. So we know that there are medications that are used for lung disease itself, and the purpose of these are to decrease the symptoms, improve the patient's ability to exercise, which means would increase their exercise tolerance. They would might become less short of breath, less fatigue, have more energy. It can decrease the number of exacerbations of their chronic health issue, and they may be used to improve the overall health status of the patient. Types of medications you might see are oral bronchodilators, inhalation therapy bronchodilators. These are both uh, rescue as well as uh, routine uh, meter dose inhalers. They might be on anticholinergic agents, steroids to decrease inflate, inflammation, vaccines to prevent things such as pneumonia and influenza. They may be on antibiotics acutely for um, certain disease, uh, mucolytic, which helps loosen or thin the secretions that they have so it would be easier for them to um, cough it up, and leukotriene modifiers work on the uh, cellular immune response or autoimmune response related to some of these diseases. You might see patients who are in anticoagulation um, patients with uh, some cardiac dysrhythmias are on anticoagulation to prevent formation of blood clots and therefore uh, no thromboembolism. We'll see them in patients who are uh, in the hospital for prevention of DVT. Um, if we put a patient on Coumadin, you're going to see that they're going to monitor what's called an international normalized ratio or INR to make sure that the medication is at the level and uh, dosing that is achieving the INR range that we want. Um, you will also see uh, patients on heparin or heparin drips who come in with what we call a pulmonary embolism which is a blood clot in the pulmonary vasculature that is blocking uh, the blood flow to certain areas of the lung, which anything distal to that clot is not participating in gas exchange. So we want to uh, get that addressed so we can improve oxygenation. So patients on anticoagulations are monitored for signs and symptoms of bleeding. And so we look for things like uh, changes in bruising or easy bruising, uh, how long it takes for uh, a, bl a clot or a, to form if they get a cut or an injury. We want to look, have them pay attention to gum bleeding, uh, nose bleeding, those types of things. And we give really good discharge teaching about their anticoagulation therapy. Some patients actually do go home on low dose low molecular weight heparin such as Lovenox and so hopefully you guys will get the opportunity to teach somebody about that. We might have medications that treat a patient's cardiovascular disease because we know that the cardiovascular health plays into our oxygenation ability. So you'll see patients treated for hypertension with various classifications of antihypertensives. Some patients may be given diuretics this will help with heart failure and edema. And you might see antiarrhythmic medications given because we know that with dysrhythmias, it changes the uh, contraction or the rate or the blood volume that is getting out to your body. So in the hospital, uh, you'll see people on sequential compressive devices or what we call SCDs. You may see people with anti-embolytic hose. We are seeing SCDs more and more and more in the hospital for any patient who comes into the hospital.
And what an SCD does, or the sequential compression device, is that it mimics, it squeezes the calf, or it may just be the ankle. But what it does is it squeezes the calf to simulate the muscle contraction that occurs when we ambulate. And what's important about wanting the muscle contraction when we ambulate is that that is what helps open the valves to bring the blood back to our heart is our valves don't always open automatically with pressure, but the muscle contraction helps, which makes it much more advantageous than just the ambulatic hose, which just prevent venous stasis. And so we don't get that stasis or the amount of blood uh, pooling in the lower extremities. And we know that that can lead to DVT as well as pulmonary emboli. So some patient education for patients with um, chronic heart or lung diseases is that we recommend immunizations. We ask them to get the pneumococcal vaccine. That is not an every year vaccine, but it is important for them to get it as well as a yearly influenza vaccine because these folks getting pneumonia or influenza they can be uh, deadly for them and they have exaggerated symptoms and can sometimes land them into the hospital. We need to help patients control risk factors, such as exposure to pollutants, and in fact, exposure to um, diet to help with weight, uh, development of coronary artery disease, and we also, any patient that is smoking, regardless of the source of the smoking, as I talked before, is that we need to have conversations about smoking cessation, which is stopping smoking. So the first thing we need to do is assess whether or not the patient has a desire to stop smoking. And um, it's always a good idea if you know in your assessment that the patient smokes to bring up smoking cessation, to talk to them about, have they thought about it? Have they ever tried it before? How is, how did it go? What were the barriers? What type of step did they use? What did they do? What things worked and what things didn't work? What triggered them to restart again? Um, which can help us offer maybe some different alternatives one thing that I do with patients for smoking cessation is we often have patients, we want them to just stop, go cold turkey, don't pick up another one. Um, I encourage patients to uh, do a risk reduction plan, which looks at how can they decrease the number or the amount of smoking they're doing. So if I am a pack a day smoker maybe I can reduce for two weeks where I only go I go every other day and get a pack of cigarettes I and then decrease it even further and further and further to where when they actually do get to zero it's not jumping from a very significant use of smoking but to a um, less amount of smoking. Or another thing that I encourage patients to do is look at where do they smoke. Do they smoke in their car and in their house and everywhere? And maybe remove, make one area for, for a week or two non-smoking such as, I'm not going to smoke in my car anymore. And then after a couple weeks, say, I'm not going to smoke in my bedroom. And then perhaps I'm not going to smoke in my house. I'm going to create a space outside. And then the more they have to work for the smoke or cigarette or whatever it is, the more time they have to stop and think, do I want to do this? Because many people smoke out of habit and they don't even really pay attention anymore to when they light up a cigarette. It's just second nature for them. 
It's just some ideas. You can also make recommendations about pharmacological treatments. Um, there's Chantix, Wellbutrin, nicotine patches, behavioral treatments, and community education programs available for them. So here's some patient education related to health literacy. And this goes to components of what makes a successful smoking sensation program. The biggest thing that is successful is that the patient believes the behavior change they are going to make is going to have a positive outcome for them. That is what they need to buy into. So when we look at oxygenation or poor oxygenation or changes in oxygenation, there are legal, ethical, and professional things we need to think about. We know that there are life and death decisions that can get made. We look at um, DNR statuses. Uh, we look um, at whether our patient is, say, do not resuscitate. We look at advanced directives that deal with the use of artificial airways or ventilation. We look at whether or not there is a medical power of attorney who is able to make the healthcare decisions for that person. And when you run into some sticky wicket or gray areas, most facilities have an ethical process in which they go through to help medical practice team members reach an ethical decision that is in the best interest of this of their patient. So if a patient is on home oxygen, what do we need to know? Um, we know that you must have an order for oxygen in the home. We know that the patient needs to be adequately educated about the use of oxygen in their home. And this is where it gets tricky because there is no, there should be no smoking in the home if the patient is placed on oxygen. Why? It is highly flammable. And patients who are, are on oxygen should not smoke while they're on the oxygen because there have been patients who have had burns to their face because they lit up a cigarette while they were on their nasal cannula. And so we need to make sure that that is pretty clear and maybe we help that patient um, have some signs around their home to let visitors know that there is no smoking in here because oxygen is being used. We want to use the type of oxygen supplemental system that keeps the patient um, least confined to their home. And there are some new ones that are very small and very light so the patient can actually go out of their home with their oxygen um, so they can have some resemblance of a normal life. And that's the end today. And we will have um, a very hands-on time when we meet the Monday after this lecture. And so bring your nursing bags and we're gonna have some fun talking about oxygenation. Thanks.